uh, 2, uh, 13 through 17, in the, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Um, and uh, let me just start by reading Mark 2, 13 through 17, and we'll dive right in. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table at his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribe of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Heavenly Father, as we look at these words, we pray that uh, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit that he would open our eyes to these truths and that they would have an impact in our life and our, our sanctification as we become more like your son. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. So one of the, one of the things about um, uh, Mark that has really uh, jumped out at me, and I keep on mentioning this, but because I keep on seeing it, is the authority of the person who he mentions at the very beginning, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the gospel in their vernacular meant um, that a great leader was coming to save you. That's it. The great leader was coming to save you. That's how they use gospel. We see that in, in uh, some inscriptions made about Caesars, some, uh, some letters written back and forth between rabbis and Pharisees. That's how they use the word gospel. Um, so when they heard gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, the first thing you would jump to is, okay, well, he's coming to save. And, um, as a human, we, as a human being, we say, okay, I think of all my problems. I have this illness. I have cancer. I have need of, you know, I need food. Um, I need a job. I need to pay my bills. I mean, those are the kinds of things we think we need saving from, right? We very rarely have a feeling of a need of saving for, uh, for salvation, for sin, right, from guilt. Even though when you're quiet and you don't have music playing or you don't have uh, a news station on or something going on, you don't really realize, um, I mean, you, you start thinking about um, what your need really is, and we don't really like to think about that. We think about the guilt. We think about the shame. We think about the mistakes that we've made. Um, but today we're going to see, at least last week we saw, that Jesus had the power. He claimed the authority to forgive sins, um, which is a really outstanding, um, 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 audacious thing to say, because only say, God take that well, they? because only God can forgive sins. Yeah. And they came to the right conclusion. They said only God can forgive sins. And they were correct, because only God can forgive sins. Remember one thing, was to save us from Rome. That's right. They, that, that was their greatest need. I'm trying to figure out where I put my water bottle. Well, I guess I carry it over here, so I'll get it. Um, their, their greatest need, they saw the Messiah was going to come and save them from Rome, from the occupation of the Romans. And that's what they wanted. They wanted, them, they wanted to be saved from Rome. And that's what they expected the Messiah to do. And you can see many times when the crowd would try to take Jesus and make him king, which is kind of a weird thing. You know, one of the times when he fed them, they were going to come and take him by force and make him king. And so he kind of escaped or left or passed through the crowd where they couldn't see him. I always wonder how that happened, but he just went through them and was gone. And uh, he did not want to be, um, he, he, in fact, he never, um, as far as I know, he didn't call himself a Messiah. Uh, he called himself the Son of Man. Um, he, he agreed when people called him the Son of God, but uh, many scholars believe the reason he didn't is because he didn't want to carry that baggage what everybody else would have pushed on that title of Messiah. Mm -hmm. But he was Jesus Christ, Christ meaning the Anointed One, which was a title for the Messiah. So he didn't run from it, but he didn't trumpet it either. Um, I, I think because he didn't want that baggage. But anyway, uh, he claimed to forgive sin. And the scribes rightly said only God can forgive sins. And uh, I, it's almost if they said that out loud, he said, you're right. <laughs> and that's kind of what he said. Um, and, uh, but he did it in such a way, in a very Middle Eastern way, by asking them questions. And uh, the conclusion is that yes, he is God, or at least he's claiming to be God. From their perspective, that's what he was very clearly saying, I'm God. So you go from that situation to this, this passage we see today. Um, when you read other gospels, 
Uh, they believe these two things are linked very closely together. So he healed the paralytic man, which that's usually what we look at as the healing of the paralytic man. But really, the point was not the healing. Remember, the point was, I can forgive sins. That was the point. The healing was, so that you may know that I have the power to forgive sins, take up your bed and walk. So the healing, which is what we focus on, our needs, things like that, was a, was a bolstering of the main point. The main point is, I have power to forgive sins. And that's right after he said, only God can forgive. Actually, the scribe said, I can, only God can forgive sins. He says, I'm going to show you I have the power to forgive sins. Take up your bed and walk. The logical conclusion to that is, Jesus is God. So the people who say, Jesus never said he was God, this is actually one of the first places I go to to show them. When you understand this whole scenario, he was claiming to be God. Yeah. Um, he, because he claimed the power to forgive sins. And, oh, by the way, he read thoughts. He forgave sins. And he healed a paralytic man. And um, if you ever really think about what it would take to heal, heal a paralytic man who couldn't walk, it's way more than just mm -hmm. your, your cut is healed, right? It's the brain paths are, re, are made fresh. Their muscles form. I mean, muscles growing instantly onto his legs from being able to stand. That's the ability true. to be able to walk, because people who have not been able to walk for a period of time, it takes years of physical therapy, and sometimes they can't even walk the way, the way they used to before they were a paraplegic or a paraplegic. So he just got up and walked. He got up, and he not only got up, he wow. took up his bed and walked out praising God, glorifying God is what it says in Matthew, and Mark says that the crowd was praising God. It was an amazing miracle. And... But you notice that they glorified God not because he forgave sins. They glorified God because he healed the man. And that's such an important, I just want to emphasize that, that we do focus on what we think we need. Jesus means what we really need, which is forgiveness of sins. So when I, uh, when I camp on this beginning sentence that this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, which means here is a great leader who's coming to save us, and his focus is on teaching, and healing is just emphasizing the teaching, and the emphasis is on that I have the power to forgive sins. And now we look at today, where you're going to see what kind of people he forgives sins of, and that also is a very, very contentious thing. Um, and, and I'm going to try to paint a picture so you can kind of see, kind of put yourself in the uh, shoes of the cultural Jew of Jesus' day by giving a little background, a little context. So first of all, go ahead. It says that he was preaching, you know, teaching. in verse 2. And he preached the word to them. Oh, in verse 2. Okay. We, don't, we don't have in Scripture what he preached. We do. But he used the circumstances. We do. Last week we did. We went through and some of the stuff he preached, right? Because yeah. we have his parables. We have the Sermon, sermon on the Mount. We have the... Um, uh, his... Uh, after, after he was baptized, uh, remember he went out? What he was saying in, in that house. Oh, yes, yes. But I think we can figure out Based on you take all this other stuff that's included and you can kind of assume what he was what he was saying. We know we know the thrust right is that repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand or the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the time what do you say in uh, in chapter one? The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And remember the repent and believe is a repent and keep repenting. Believe and keep believing. That's that marks people who are entering the kingdom of heaven and all of his. All of the word that he preached and teach fell under that. So this is the core of what he preached. And he may have given different stories and had different situations, but this is what he came back to again and again, you see, is what I believe. So what I was thinking, what I was trying to get at here is, it, it, it's not recorded here what he actually said mm -hmm. in the house, but he used the circumstances, his actions to speak louder than the way he preached to get across the message. Mm -hmm. Right. And so should we. Right. So, um, some of the context. Capernaum, that's where uh, Jesus' um, uh, ministry was centered in Galilee. So, it's Galilean ministry. It all seems to come back to Capernaum. Um, it was situated in the vicinity of what's called the Via Maris. Now, you may know Via. It's a, it's a Roman meaning road, right? You've heard Via Dolorosa, uh, the road of suffering. Um, this was Via Maris, and it was a very, very important trade. It was guarded very heavily by the Romans, uh, so the trade would go through. Roman roads were there. It went from Damascus, Syria, all the way down to Egypt. The trade back and forth and back and forth. It came right by Capernaum. 
And Capernaum were, was known all, literally all over the Roman Empire for their salted fish that came from the Sea of Galilee. It was uh, really a delicacy that they really liked. And so it was quite a fishing industry in Capernaum. And there's a lot of traders that would come in. You could buy a lot of stuff in the markets of Capernaum. But the main thing that was sold is fish. Not just for you to go to the grocery store and buy fish, but I mean in bulk, like cartloads of fish that would go out, be salted, and could go all the way to Rome. Uh, we have records of it showing up in Rome and people writing about the, the uh, salted, uh, salted fish from the Sea of Galilee, things like that. So it was very, very popular. There's quite an industry there. Um, as far as we know, there's about 1,500 people that lived in Capernaum at the time of Jesus. That's about the size of the town. Um, there was a contingent of Roman troops there because there was important trade routes. Um, in AD 20, a Roman centurion had a basalt synagogue, and um, basalt is black, this very black rock. So it's a synagogue. Imagine, many times when you think of Roman structures, you think of this glistening white mm -hmm. marble structure, but this was glistening black. It was a black basalt synagogue that was built, and that was the, that was the rock that was around the area. And so the centurion had it built in AD 20. Um, if, you're, if you can do the math in your head, that was what? 13-ish years before Jesus was there. So Jesus was teaching in a brand new synagogue that was very unique. Um, and if you go over there to Capernaum, they've actually uncovered the foundation of this basalt synagogue. You can see the black stones that were there. Um, those were the stones that Jesus stood on when he taught um, very frequently in the synagogue of Capernaum. But because of the fishing industry, because of the trade route, because of the Roman contingent, um, there were taxes, you know. And it was not a very uncomfortable uh, place, uh, a very uncomfortable thing in their lives, but it was a very important part and painful part in their life, in the daily life of Capernaum. If you lived in a little town off to the side, you might be taxed when you go to town, but you weren't taxed in your town. That wasn't big enough for a Roman tax booth to be there with the Roman guards backing them up and stuff like that. Um, so you kind of didn't have to deal with that pain except when you went into town. But imagine living in Capernaum and seeing the tax collector every day. And uh, when I explain why that's painful, um, uh, hopefully you'll feel, feel the pain of these and, and, and the hatred from the Jews to the traitors that would work for the Romans and take money from their own people and send it to a pagan government. I mean, there was, it was patriotism and religion and just um, believing, of, believing of, uh, a belief of betrayal. Um, when you dealt with a tax collector and you saw them all the time and you saw how they could levy taxes, that also was really, really challenging. But anyway, because of this, I don't know if you ever thought about so Levi, which we're, I'm going to call him Levi because he's not called Matthew until chapter 2, but his original name was Levi um, and uh, son of Alphaeus. In the, in the Hebrew way of saying it, the Hebraic way would say Levi ben Alphaeus would be his name. That's how he would, uh, ben means son. Um, Alpheus, his father would be Alpheus. They didn't have surnames like we do. They just signed the son. So I would be David Ben Kenneth. <laughs> that would be my, that would be my Hebraic name, you know, brought over into our language. Um, but this was Levi Ben Alpheus, and uh, he was a son of Alpheus. But he would have been a very famous person, or you might say infamous person, within Capernaum. Think of a town of 1,500 people. Back then, that was fairly large to us. That's not that big. But it's not that hard to know 1,500 people. You can come across them all the time. And here he is in the tax booth all the time, right in the center of town or the center of uh, commerce is where they would build these things. Uh, taxes. Uh, so we talked about Capernaum taxes. And I'm doing this because I think it helps us when we read this passage. It's going to hit a little harder when you have that cultural background. So when Mark wrote to, the, to this early, the early church, they would understand all these cultural things. This is just built in with how they live, right? It's like explaining water to a fish. <laughs> Like, I don't understand because I live in it. It's just part of who I am. Uh, to us, we live out of the water, so to speak. And so it helps us to understand a little bit. So the taxes, now we don't like taxes, um, but we would have much less like them in this time. Um, in our day, there is some predictableness to our taxes, right? So we know this year, here's how much we have to pay. We know last year, that's how much we pay. And uh, you can kind of do, I mean, we don't like it changing as much as it does, but you generally can get an idea of about what your taxes are going to be, right? You know, if I make this much, here's how much Social Security gets taken out, and here's how much federal gets taken out. You can go onto a, a website and you can plug in, well, I'm about to get a promotion. What is my tax? What is my, what is my take home pay going to be? It's a little predictable, right? Um, in this day, it was not predictable at all. Um, they had set taxes. But it wasn't just a, hey, there's a cart of fish, pay us this amount of money. 
it was totally up to the tax collector to decide how much you were going to pay. One day it may be five shekels or five coins, and the next day it may be 100 coins. Why? Because the tax collector is having a bad day and he doesn't like you. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. That's, wow. that's what it was. And so let's say you were a friend with a tax collector. You may get by. Oh, hey, hey, Steve, come on, come on by. And Heather's like, wait a second, what's Steve going by for? And it's like, oh, Steve's my friend. I let him go by. Now, 100 coins. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine that? And, and then you might not be happy with Steve because Steve got by. What are you, friends with this trader and so on and so forth? What's going on here? I mean, it was a, it's a really, really rough thing. And if you didn't really object because they had a the power of the Roman government behind them. And taxes, the ability to collect taxes were done by franchises. So you had to pay a very significant amount of money to own that franchise, and that, that area. And you were the one that got all the taxes from that. And how they did it is they said, okay, let's say Wink became a tax collector, right? And so Wink's a Jew, we're all Jews, right? He's a Jew and he says, you know what? I like the money, so I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna pay a lot of my money in so I have this franchise. Now he can tax all of Spokane Valley. Mm -hmm. He can set up wherever he wants, and the only thing he has to do is pay me X amount per year. So I give him a quota. You have to give me 100,000 coins a year. I mean, I don't know what it was called back then, but 100,000 coins a year. As long as he gave Rome 100,000 coins a year, he could do whatever he wanted when it comes to taxes. Wow. So he could collect 2 million coins. Rome didn't care. As long as they got their 100,000, they were okay with it. So you can see some tax collectors um, could become very, very wealthy on the backs of the people who used to be their friends. Used to be. Right? Because not only, and think from a Jew, again, so try to put your Jewish hat on, religion is your country, country is your religion. It's very linked together, patriotism and your statehood. So not only did Wink work for a pagan government, this irreligious person now, who's an outcast, tax collector, sinner, he's not allowed in a, in a synagogue, He's not allowed to give witness. He's not allowed in court. I can't trust his testimony because he's a, he's a, he's a traitor. Oh, wow. um, there's no fellowship he couldn't purchase from the market. Nobody who's reputable would be seen with him. Um, and on top of that, he hates his people. So what because the money? Well, I'll get that in a second. So, <laughs> so, so really, there's no fellowship with his people at all. The only people you'd have fellowship with is, you see right here, get, look at the people who came to the dinner. Who came to the dinner? The other tax collectors and sinners. sinners who don't care. They're already outcasts. So only the outcasts would hang out with the tax collectors. Now, your life would be very nice with a lot of money, but you wouldn't have the, the love of your people. Um, they, they would hate you as a traitor, spit at you, uh, wouldn't talk to you. I mean, people that you'd grown up with were, were gone for good because they saw you as a traitor. So that's what tax collector is. Obviously, your friends would turn to think, are you turn your back on us, but wouldn't they also think you turn your back on God? Because absolutely, nation... there's a, absolutely. That, the, that, thank you for mentioning that because when I mentioned religion and statehood, mm -hmm. they saw that person as unholy and that they were going to hell, basically, well, is how we would say it, is that they're not going to be in heaven. God's not gonna accept people that hated his own people. So, so they're not only outcasts and sinners, they're not going to have the fellowship with God for all eternity. And, and the person who became a tax collector as a Jew knew this. Matthew knew this, or Levi knew this. And um, so that's, a, that's the background of what a tax collector and what taxes meant back then. Wouldn't it be very hard for them to accept the fact that uh, he became one of Christ's disciples? That, that feeds right into the story. And that's why I think when you, when you understand how hated, it's not just all we hate them. It's a... It's a, I was trying to figure out what would be an example in our day and age, but it's hard because we're so pluralistic and we invite a lot of cultures and things. We don't really hate cultures as much. But um, I'm thinking maybe during the Cold War, like when I was growing up, um, communists, right? We hate somebody who's a communist and nobody would ever identify as a communist. Well, now they do. You know, people, socialists and things like that. But back when I was growing up, to even call yourself a socialist or a communist, you would be ostracized. Yeah, and I'm talking as a teenager with my other teenage friends, you know, that was just, you were not, you didn't want to be a commie, you know? You're united, they call themselves Democrats. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move right on. <laughs> You're thinking out loud, right? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So just, just hold that in mind. And last thing I want to mention for context is disciple. Um, we think of disciple as somebody who is somebody I'm going to mentor. You almost use mentoring and discipleship together. 
Um, like I, I pick somebody younger than me and I disciple them to become really like me. That's, that's what we think of as discipleship. Um, but the word disciple um, literally means um, somebody who is just a learner. It's, it's used um, to describe somebody who learns by following behind somebody. That's, that's the literal Greek word. You follow behind somebody and learn. The word mathetes and the root of mathetes um, is a mental effort meant to think something through. So you're following somebody, you're thinking through what they're doing, applying it to your life and becoming like them. That's what a disciple is. But it also was, um, was used for follow. So there actually is a play on words. When Jesus asked his disciples to follow him and be my disciple, he really is saying, follow me and be a follower. There's, there's a play on words that we don't see in the, in the English because we use two different words, but in the Greek, it's very similar. It was a play on words. What Jews loved plays on words. This was a pun, is what it was. It was a play on words. Follow me and be my disciple, which is follow me and be a follower. Of course, if I'm following you, I'm a follower, but it's a redundant thing to say, follow me um, and, and be my disciple. So he put all this together. Let's look at, let's look at the passage um, with this background. In, this, in these verses, there's really five verses here, and there's really five points. There's the crowd that comes to hear Jesus teach. There's uh, Jesus calling Levi, um, a dinner with the outcasts, the scribes questioning the disciples, and then Jesus' response. So Jesus' teaching, we don't have to spend too much time on this because we've spent a lot of time in the last few weeks. But Jesus said multiple times so far in Mark, my purpose and the reason I came was to teach or to preach, right? Um, and here we see Jesus by the sea teaching, and a crowd is gathered to hear him teach. Now, we know from other places that when he taught, there were sometimes demons that spoke out in opposition to him and he exercised them. Some people, while he was teaching, would be brought to him while they were sick and he would heal them. So along with the teaching, that was his purpose. But we also know by the examples we've seen before that there were probably healings and exorcisms and stuff going on in between the teaching. And it's not teaching where somebody just, he got up there and started talking for three or four hours. Um, a Jewish way of teaching, a rabbinical way of teaching is telling a story and then engaging and listening to what they say. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? So I would, I maybe give a, a couple of statements and then ask Steve, what do you think about that? And I would listen to what Steve has to think, say about that. And then I would respond with another story and then ask another question and another story and ask another question. And I'm leading Steve towards a direction or the crowd towards a direction. That's kind of how you taught. So it was very, it wasn't just a lecture for all day. It was sort of a back and forth interaction by stories and parables and, and that sort of thing. Um, so the, the Levi's call, Mark writes that Jesus passed by Levi's tax booth. Um, the world may say randomly, but on purpose, <laughs> he, he followed, he, he passed this said, follow me. And he got up and followed Jesus. That's, that's how Mark records it in this very short way. But in this simple verse, he gives us two just outstanding, I say outstanding, astounding, not outstanding, astounding <laughs> pieces of information. First of all, that Jesus will call a tax collector um, to be his disciple. I mean, which self-respecting, holy man of God would call a sinner, unholy, godless, traitor, pagan server to be his? Not only will that sully the rabbi's stature, it also would ruin his reputation with all his other disciples. And would anybody listen to the teaching of somebody who would accept somebody like this? Bad enough he chose smelly old fishermen. Now we <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, uh, the second thing is, so the first one is that he called the tax collector. The second is the tax collector followed him. Because as I gave you the background of being a tax collector, there were people that were chomping at the bit to pay all this money to Rome so they could have that franchise. When Matthew walked away, you better believe he would never, ever be a tax collector ever again, ever. And do you think that his friends and, and, and the community would accept him when he left the tax? Absolutely not. He was always a sinner, unless there's restitution made like Zacchaeus did, right? Um, and even then... You, I mean, you know how it works. Once your reputation is gone, it's always wounded in some, in some point, right? Mm -hmm. And so he, he left something that was secure. The only thing he really would have been into it for, as we know, is the money and the stature of the money he could purchase and the friends that he had that the money purchased, things like that. But, um, but he's not gaining favor with his Jewish friends. Um, he's bringing dishonor on the rabbi he goes to. And he's never going to be able to go back to where he was. Now, remember after Jesus rose from the dead, remember what uh, Peter, James, and John did, what they were doing? They were fishing. They went, back to their, they went back to what they did before. 
It doesn't say Matthew went back to tax collecting because <laughs> he can't. So this, this, is a, this is a leaving everything behind and he did it right then and there. And um, it may be, I mean, it's, it's, it's just astounding to see this, but, but think about this. Matthew had been in Capernaum. I mean, that's where his tax booth is, right? That's where his franchise is. He had heard, I guarantee you, he'd heard of this teacher in the synagogue. Now, he couldn't go there, but he heard of him, right? Um, he heard of the healings. You know, 1,500 people, the word got around. Um, did you hear what this, did you hear about this? Did you hear about the confrontation? Did you hear about him casting out the demon, this and that? And then Jesus had gone to the other towns and preached. He is in the place where he hears all these stories as he's coming through and he's collecting taxes. So he's heard about Jesus and he's probably really close yeah, he's probably really close to the harbor where he sees Jesus because that's where the commerce would have been. And he's probably hearing Jesus teach over here. Um, he's seeing the effects. He's now seeing this person he's heard a lot about. So this isn't the first time he's, um, I mean, he's heard about Jesus and probably heard Jesus teaching. Um, in fact, if the Roman centurion paid for the synagogue, you better believe, uh, we know, again, from his history, that there was sort of these two circles of synagogues. There was the Jewish people that were on the inside, but there were Roman people that wanted to be Jews that were like seeking God in their own way on the outside listening. So it was sort of the second tier. And it's not, it's not out, of the, um, out of the realm of possibility that some of the Roman guards who guarded him, or maybe even Matthew himself, were outside listening to what was going on. So this wasn't the first interaction he had with them, but the first call that Jesus gave to him. Dad, you had to say something. I was just saying it's sort of a parallel between him and Paul because the first person that the Holy Spirit used to give us the first book in the New Testament was Matthew. And the persecutor of Christians was Paul. And God, that's how God used Paul. That's right. That's right. Um, so when he called them and he responded. So um, to ascribe this was absolutely the wrong thing to do for a religious teacher. Um, and so, I'm, again, I'm trying to spend some time on this so you can kind of understand why the scribes asked Jesus this question. I don't think it was trying to dis, discredit anybody. I really think they were at the point, I don't even think they were at the full-blown opposition yet. I think they were really confused because Jesus clearly was from God. Look at the miracles. They couldn't deny that. They heard his teachings and they couldn't refute some of the things he's saying, even though they didn't agree with it. <coughs> I think they were really confused about what Jesus was doing. Why would you call a tax collector and why are you eating with sinners? That doesn't make any sense. Why is your teacher doing this? I really think that's a legitimate question that they had. Like, I, love his I don't answer. understand. I don't understand. And um, So did, they didn't hang out with sinners to get nope. sinners saved? No, you know what I'm trying absolutely to say? not. Um, wow. And hold on to that thought because we're, we're going to have time and we'll talk about that because what we're going to see today I mean, in this passage is really the contrast, again, between all the world's religions and Christianity. There's really only two religions. There's mm -hmm. Christianity and there's all these other religions. And all the other religions work pretty much, as far as I know, I've never seen an exception to this. They work the same way. You must do certain things for God to be pleased with you. Oh Some you can be sure because they say you do these things and yes, God will be pleased with you. Some will say you do these things and maybe God will be pleased with you. Some will say just do these things. <laughs> Don't really know. Yeah. Um, I have some Mormon friends that I was that I worked with uh, really closely, and they never really knew whether they had done enough, mm -hmm. and they constantly struggled with that. As I don't know if I've done enough, and so they oh keep my. on doing and doing. Um, um, anyway, so the religious. Uh, so he goes to this dinner. Um, it says that Matthew was reclining at table, which meant that he was having a dinner. Um, Culturally, to have dinner with somebody in the Middle East is to extend your personal fellowship to that person. We have dinner. We want to get to know somebody. And somebody wouldn't say, well, Steve came over to David's house. Therefore, Steve and Dave are best friends. They're, the be they're best friends now. But that's kind of how they saw it. Mm -hmm. When you had dinner with somebody, you were extending your fellowship and bonding a friendship with that person and inviting them into your fellowship. It was more than just eating together. And you see this even in modern day. Um, the, the treaty, for example, between Israel and Egypt um, was signed and it was a contract for several years and never was ratified until um, Mubarak and I can't remember the Israeli leader sat down and had dinner. Until they had dinner and they broke bread together, that's when both countries saw that as a ratified contract. They still to this day hold that very strongly. And so dinner is much, it's much more, I might say, spiritual or sacred to them than, than it is to us. 
Um, in one, one rabbi, they taught it this way, that you take one piece of bread and you break it and you feed it to two people and that unites the two people together just if they were one piece of bread. Is kind of how they saw it. That's sort of this... Better than blood. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like blood brother. We, yeah, that's very close to what we were like blood brothers where you would cut a little bit on both hands and you would shake and your blood would mingle. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how they saw breaking bread together. It was more than just having a dinner. So Jesus... Sitting in a house inside of, inside of uh, an outcast house with sinners and tax collectors and eating dinner was communicating to everybody. Not only did he invite an outcast to be his disciple, now he's eating with them and extending his fellowship to them. And that was confusing to them because that's not how you make restitution when you're a sinner. They had a very precise way of... Um, of seeking forgiveness, and one of it, one of the ways is what Zacchaeus did. Remember what he did? He said, whatever I've wronged, I will pay seven times, right? Mm -hmm. That's how you made restitution. He came, came back into the grace according to their rules and their laws, um, and he hadn't done that, and yet Jesus is at his house eating with sinners and mm -hmm. tax collectors. Steve, remember when you and your son helped me clean that nasty house? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But we didn't stay away because it was nasty. You, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was gross. Yeah. But we still went, didn't we? Sure. As Christians, we went and cleaned this lady's mm -hmm. house. We didn't push her away. Right. So we did good, Steve. <laughs> no, I've I never heard of what good. he's talking. Yeah. This is neat. <clears throat> so notice there is no mention of repentance or contrition on the part of sinners and tax collectors here. It was simply a choice of Jesus to have dinner at Levi's house. That, and if that is offensive to you, um, just think how offensive it was to the scribes. Um, anyway, so the religious leaders come to him and says, why does he eat with these outcasts? Now he asked the disciples, not Jesus, probably practically because Jesus was inside reclining at table. Um, they would not go inside an outcast's house. So my guess is they asked the disciples and the disciples brought the question to Jesus. Jesus heard it, came out and talked to them. But practically, that's probably what happened. Very similar, remember the parable of the two sons? Uh, we call it the parable of the prodigal son, but mm. the point wasn't the prodigal, that's why. Someday, we'll, I'll, I'll go through that, but um, culturally, the, the older son stood outside and his father came out to speak with him because the son wouldn't go in, because to go in would be to condone what was happening on the inside. I think that's probably very similar. That's a very cultural picture into what they would do. So the scribes are outside asking the question. They went in and came out and asked the question. So anyway, so why? Um, okay, we'll get to Jesus' response just for the sake of time. His response is to the point and really layered with meaning. And to read how Jesus responded, I'm going to read three passages here. We've already read one, which is Mark 2, 17. It says, those who are well have no need of a physician. Those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew, which I think is unique, it only shows, this only shows up in Matthew, is Matthew 9.13. And if you look at Matthew 9.13, he said this. Uh, Matthew added this one thing. Um, go and learn what this means. And he's telling the scribes, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. That's what he told them to go and learn. And he explains why he's telling them to go learn it. He says, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So in Mark, he says, I call the righteous, but sinners. And he shows that up. The physician comes to those who are sick. Matthew has this one additional saying. And uh, the, the chutzpah, <laughs> I think I'm saying that right, which means the gall or the audacity for Jesus to ask a scribe to go learn what something meant, was like me asking a marathon runner, a champion marathon runner, to go learn what it means to run. Or to go to a championship swimmer and say, go learn how to swim, mm -hmm. right? He's going and telling the scribes, go learn what this means. <laughs> In front of his disciples, I mean, it, only Jesus could do this. Yeah. <laughs> or have the, have the gall. I say gall. For, my, for me, it's gall. For him, I think he's just saying, go, go learn what this means. I think you've misunderstood. what I, I mean, I think what he's saying here, I believe what he's saying, you've misunderstood the scriptures. Go look at the scriptures, see what this means. And, uh, he's, and what it says, God is speaking. That's Hosea 6.6. 6. And in Hosea 6.6, 6, he says, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. And just a point of um, like something interesting. Um, you notice that in Matthew, it says, I desire mercy. But in Hosea, it says, I desire steadfast love. And you're like, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is Jesus is speaking from a translation, not the original. <laughs> it's a translation he's speaking from. Because they translated Hebrew to Greek. 
And in the Greek, it says mercy. But in the, in the Hebrew, it says steadfast love. And that is one of my favorite words. We went through the, um, the, uh, the minor prophets. Remember the word that popped up? Remember, remember it? Hesed. Hesed. Yeah, hes hesed. That means the steadfast love. It's a deep, loyal love that never changes. Um, it might be comparing, the closest we could compare it to is the love of a boyfriend and a girlfriend, and then 60 years later after they marry, the love between both of them. It's deeper, it's stronger, it's quieter. It's not as, you know, it's not as uh, emotionally um, you know, volatile. Uh, it's just steady and strong, and that's what has said. And Jesus is saying, I desire has said, not sacrifice. And that, that statement, it just is, is just amazing when you, and I'm not gonna be able to unpack all of this, but if you can hold these three things in your mind at once, I, let me just give you some things of, that I jotted down. First of all, Jesus came to call sinners, not the righteous, not the healthy, but sinners and the sick. Um, and when you think about it, to who else would the physician go except the sick and unwell? Well, of course he's going to go to the sinners. Um, and what kind of call? Uh, what kind of call did he give to these sinners and to the sick? He said, follow me. Uh, the call of Jesus results in leaving the old and pursuing the new. Levi was the extreme case. So it comes right after the example of Levi. He was an extreme case because he could never return, yet he still followed. The other disciples, many of them could go back to the old profession, but Matthew goes the ultimate following him. Um, now, Peter and John and the others, I think, would have followed Jesus if they couldn't go back. That wasn't the point. It's just that Matthew made a sacrifice. Notice I said the word sacrifice. He gave up to follow. And Jesus is saying, I desire love, not sacrifice. In the world's religions, they demand sacrifice before God is pleased with you. Jesus is saying, I desire your love first. And then the sacrifice is a result. And we, we get this mixed up so frequently. Um, is faith works? Or is works faith? Does works result in faith? Or does faith result in works? And the answer is faith and works are linked together, yes, but works are a result from my faith. They're not a preceder to faith. I don't work and then have faith. That's how the world looks at it. They say you must do these things and have faith and God will be pleased with you. And Christianity says you, it's already done. Believe that it's done and works are a result of the faith that you have. When I first got saved, I told Barb, I says, I can't get saved. God doesn't want somebody like me. And she said, no, you're the prime example of who God wants. Right. He wants sinners. That's right. And that's like, what he said, word for word, that's right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. And the part that's interesting is everyone's a sinner, but like when Jesus dealt with the Pharisees, he told them, because you say you have no sin, your sin remains. Right. So we're all sinners, but we're just the ones that admit it and come to the cross. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, um, he came to call sinners not the righteous. So the understanding of this, I'm understanding what he means by not the righteous, because righteous, there's nothing wrong with righteousness. He's not saying righteousness is wrong, but he said, I didn't come to the righteous. So righteousness you... comes from God. God's righteousness is what he is pleased with, not my righteous. So what he's saying here, and again, I'm, I'm pulling in other scriptures from, from all throughout, uh, throughout, throughout the New Testament, to, to say this, because just for the sake of time, mm -hmm. but those who are self-righteous and not God-made righteous, That's the Pharisees, right? those are the righteous that he did not come for because pride keeps them from admitting that I'm a sinner and I need mercy. That's and the Pharisees. Matthew realized, I need mercy, I'm a sinner. Those people who are sinners are closer and say they're sinners are closer to salvation than those who say they are righteous. Like in the world today, like, like we don't have quote-unquote Pharisees in, in our Gentile world, but yeah. people that say, oh yeah, that, that Jesus thing's good for you, but I've got my own thing, and that's that's a form of self-righteousness. Even right. though they're not trying to say I'm righteous, they're saying I'm good, I'm, I'm okay right. where I'm at. And so that's basically saying, I don't need your permission. That's what my son-in-law is saying. But right. like Pastor said just a couple weeks ago, or last week, he said, um, people believe they'll go before God, and they'll say, well, look at all the things that I've done, and my good outweighs my bad. I mean, I don't know how many times I've heard that from people when I'm witnessing to you. I think I'm basically a good person. Mm -hmm. uh, that is self-righteous. How do they know that yeah. good is going to happen? By my standard yeah. right. that yeah. I can achieve. Yeah. <laughs> I'm self-righteous. That's the whole thing, right? Wow. I can tell you this, but you're not the standard. <laughs> right. Right. So you're like, oh, okay. 
<laughs> and the, the shocking thing is that God says, you're righteous as this filthy rag yeah. to yeah. me. Just, you just said, yeah. 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 Sorry, I didn't hear that. Bread. Well, it's worse than that, yeah. but I'll just leave it at that. I'd say that. Yeah. That's yep. pretty dirty, I'm saying. Wow. So, I never heard that before. The only righteousness which God accepts is his own righteousness. Um, one of the best places I think you can go to is Romans 1, 16 and 17. And just summarizing this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for our salvation to everyone who believes. We know that part. But listen to the rest in verse uh, end of 16 and 17. For in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Um, the, righteous, the righteous shall live by faith. So the righteousness of God is imputed to me. So it's not that righteousness is bad. It's whose righteousness that God sees. Is it mine? My, my rules, like we were just talking about, do I say, hey, here's a set of rules, or a lot of times the world, there's always somebody they're comparing themselves to. Well, I'm not as bad as Steve. And Steve says, well, I'm not as bad as Wink. And Wink says, well, I'm not as bad as Heather. And there, there's always this comparison. Well, theoretically, <laughs> there's one person in this world, right? If you went that all the way through, there's somebody in this world who is the worst, and everybody else is more righteous than that person. But that's self-righteousness. That's comparing to that. And Matthew 5, 48 says, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's the standard that we have. Ooh. And I don't, uh, I don't have the time to go through all this. I'll, I'll cover a little bit more of this next week. But I want to conclude with this, that the scribes were self-righteously pointing out the faults of Jesus' ministry. And he was explaining why they were mistaken. Their logic was something like this. God is holy. He gave us his law. Sinners are not following God's law. Therefore, no fellowship should be given until they conform to God's holy standard. Um, and uh, he tells them to go and learn what I'm looking for. He says, I'm looking for mercy. And uh, we would think that God, as holy as he is, would have a very strict um, view of sin, which he does. But he says that he leaves sins unpunished because it's his kindness that leads us to repentance through his forbearance of sins, causing them not to be punished. I mean, if our sins were punished at the point that we sinned, there'd be nobody here in this room. But it's his forbearance over time that he's left him unpunished. Now, he will not leave it unpunished forever. Mm -hmm. But in his forbearance, he's leaving them unpunished. So it's his kindness and his mercy that's drawing us to salvation. And thankfully, we all experience who are his believers, who are his children, that uh, that, that forbearance. That, um, that, and that's in, by the way, if you want to look that passage up, it's one of the best passages in Romans, I think, in Romans 3, um, the first part of Romans 3. But God demonstrates his own justice and that while we were still sinners, sinners, Christ died for us. So justice will be paid um, either by us or by Christ. And uh, by faith, we look towards Christ. And because of that, his righteousness becomes my righteousness. And that's the righteousness that God reaches out to. But it's his mercy that allows that righteousness to be imputed to me. So when Jesus, and Jesus is speaking to the leaders, to the Jewish leaders, to the religious leaders saying, listen, learn this. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I don't need them to make all these sacrifices so I'm pleased. I don't need them to do all these works so I'm pleased with them. I'm reaching out. To, I'm choosing this person right here to show my mercy to. And because I've done that, he's now going to have faith and God's righteousness will be imputed to him. And, that's, and that is radical confrontation to religion. Um, this is true religion. There is only two religions. I don't like to throw out the word I don't like to throw out the word religion like some people do say, well, it's a relationship. It is, but also is a religion. Jesus uses the word. Uh, Paul uses the word. So it is a contrast to the world's religion. The issue is whose righteousness are you standing by? Mm -hmm. Whose righteousness are you clothed in? Mm -hmm. um, one, God's pleased with and he desires and the other he hates. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, sorry I went a little late there, but any comments before we pray? Yes. Just a quick observation about, you know, how standards are an interesting thing in the <coughs> secular world. Like, I can say, oh, I have a pretty good basketball game, but uh, no, I'm sorry, Michael Jordan set that standard <laughs> yeah. a lot higher. So so it's interesting how in, in the world they can recognize certain standards. Like, I can cook a mean beef dish, but I'm not Chef Gordon Ramsay. And then but suddenly when it comes to the spiritual matters, Jesus who set the perfect standard, suddenly now it's not as, as important. And that just speaks to the depravity of our hearts, I think. Yeah. And, and, and Satan feeds that depravity. Yeah. I mean, he builds a world system that tells us, you just need to do a little bit more. You need to do this, you need to do that, and then God will be happy with you. And that is, that is the, those are the road signs on the way to hell. 
That's the broad path that says, heaven this way, and right. do these things, and God will be pleased with or you. Or they go the other way because they know they can't achieve it. So no, everybody gets a prize who participated, yeah. and so they go the other way sometimes. They're like, no, they just don't want to be accountable for it. Yep. That's crazy. Matthew, uh, alias Levi, says in the passage in, in Matthew 9, 12, talks about uh, sacrifice, which is works. And, and, and as opposed to mercy, which is grace and mercy. That's not mentioned clearly in the Mark passage, but who would understand better than Levi who was actually in the story? That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's true. And all the other religions are based on sacrifice. Oh, wow. Give up this, wear this, do this, observe this, fast here, do this. I mean, it's all sacrifices you're making to make God pleased with you. God say, I don't care about that. I want your heart. I want your love. Anyway, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your words. We thank you for this glimpse into, into Christ's life and his teaching and his interactions with the disciples and with the scribes. We, we thank you for the, uh, the treasure of being able to see these things and understand these things. We thank you for the, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit in our hearts that helps us uh, um, comprehend these things. We pray that the ministry of the Holy Spirit would continue in our hearts, would uh, bring these things to mind, cause us to meditate on them, that we would uh, mull them over uh, ruminate over them and make them part of how we think and how we see. We pray that we also would seek mercy, that people who sin differently than us, that we would see them in through merciful eyes and not um, a sacrificial eyes like the scribes did. Pray that you would give us a heart for the sinners, give us a heart for the tax collectors, so to speak, um, and then it would begin right now. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen.